Welcome back to here with Goldberg. Today we're going to be talking about the fall of Tsar Nicholas II and why I believe this occurred. Uh, recently I've seen a lot of folks sporting avatars on the internet.com of Nicholas and there will be those memes like go back in time, give him a look on how to run the country. My general opinion is that he was, as a man, I think he was well-intentioned, but he was caught up in a system and a regime that he just didn't really stand a chance. It's very difficult to reform government, especially a uh, an empire of that size and scale, and he certainly wasn't up to the job, although it's hard to imagine how many people would have been. Uh, as far as sources are concerned, I've read two books by Edvard Rosinski. This one, The Last Tsar, is about Nicholas. It's okay. Uh, he is a playwright, so you get a lot of flowery language that's probably not um, optimal. And also towards the end, he spends too much time talking about investigating the murder of you know the Romanov family, which I didn't feel helped the biographical narrative that much. So there's probably better books out there on Nicholas, but I will say this one, uh, Alexander II, the Great Tsar, excellent, very much worth uh, examining. And it does doesn't uh, talk about Alexander, but also goes into the origins of the Russian people, which, uh, funny enough, a lot of the names are actually transliterated from the Nordic regions, the Scandinavian area, which is fascinating. And then, of course, you have a lot of German blood in the Russian royal family, which makes you wonder, why were they fighting at the end of the day? I've never understood European monarchies and the way they operated. But this is a good book to check out. It's definitely more concise than the one on, on uh, Nicholas and it's got great information. Alternatively, you could check out this one by Robert Service. That's got good reviews, probably a little bit more of a, a traditional biography. So where do we begin? Well, his grandfather, Alexander II, was considered to be you know, the last great Tsar. He was a relatively effective ruler. He operated on the basis of three principles, which would be taken on board by his... Uh, you know, by Alexander III, and those were uh, nationality, orthodoxy, and autocracy. But at the same time, he was a reformer. So he made pretty big strides, like uh, he ended serfdom effectively, although the big criticism was you take with these people who have been basically peasants, and you don't have much of a system for them to start operating in this new realm where they have supposed freedom to become property owners. So it sort of backfired because if these folks, they don't know what to do with themselves, the revolutionaries and that message the communism becomes more attractive over time. Uh, whether communism was being advocated in the same way as in 1917, not so much, but you have a lot of anarchist and terrorist attempts to take down Alexander II. Even though he was pretty stable, you know, he had some successful foreign policy excursions, which could have been even more so uh, were it not for the UK trying to, you know, shill and cuck and undermine him because they were afraid of Russia becoming powerful. Um, what happens is one particular attack, which was actually on a train, that didn't kill him, but the damage would actually later on is believed to have, have been something that festered over time and then killed Alexander III years later from an infection. So it just shows you how crazy it was. And he was finally taken out after so many assassination attempts. He was taken out by some terrorists. And that brought, of course, um, our friend here to power. So Alexander III comes in. He feels like his father, by reforming, uh, this is what you get, right? The terrorists are violent. They're trying to destroy you. So he cracks down. He starts you know, slamming like the local governments. He really forces the autocracy. But there's relative peace, although you have in the uh, 1890s, you do have a pretty significant famine. But overall, he's considered to be kind of like a decent caretaker. He wasn't in office or on the throne for that long, but he did a decent job. But okay, then, and he actually... Um, this was one of his main advisors, Konstantin Kodonoshtev. I probably didn't pronounce it correctly. This guy, very closely aligned with the Orthodox Church, in line with those principles we brought up earlier, you know, nationality, orthodoxy, autocracy. 
no mercy, you know, don't keep reforming because it's a waste of time. And then finally, Tsar Nicholas comes to power. It is believed the first thing when he found out he was going to ascend to the throne, he tried to give it to someone else. He was just totally overwhelmed. Uh, the picture here is with one of his cousins from the UK. You can see the similarities. They almost look like twins. And there is some belief. Now, you know, it's hard to say, but there is some belief that the police state uh, of the conservative nobility that was established under his predecessor had almost created, like we see today, like a deep state, theoretically, where these people were trying to uh, maintain their own in uh, interests. So when Nicholas II comes in and he has some reform-minded perspectives, they're like, okay, we're not going to let you, you know, diminish our power. We're going to start reclaiming it. We're going to undermine you. This is what Red, uh, Redvinsky advances, whether it's true or not. Eh, hard to say, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility because very few governments, when someone new comes in, are actually overhauled entirely. There is that consistent, uninterrupted administration. And so early on, uh, Nicholas just gets associated with bad luck. You have the traditional ceremony, the salt and the bread. He screws it up. Uh, there's a trampling of a bunch of people in one of the cities. So already he doesn't have the best image amongst the public. Uh, you have the Russo-Japanese War. The Russians were not as technologically advanced as they thought. They assumed they were going to just wipe out the Japanese because we're Russian, they're Japanese. They failed. That was a huge cultural shock. It was a global shock that an Asian power would actually defeat a European power. And right after that, you actually end up with a revolution in 1905, which Nicholas responds to by creating some sort of constitution. But it was already, okay, we can move this guy. And even the Russo-Japanese War, that's one of the theories with this sort of deep state. The argument is that was instigated by that conservative elite to further weaken Nicholas and make him ineffective with his reforms. Uh, and then, of course, you have Rasputin. Now, it's really hard to say. Some people believe he had a relationship with the Tsarina. It's not 100% certain. Rasputin was this weird mystic figure totally a philanderer. He'd go around screwing women, having drunken parties, but then he was supposedly had these great healing abilities. And you say, well, why didn't Nicholas just take him out? Nicholas actually credited Rasputin with helping to heal his son, who had was a hemophiliac, was very sickly. He claimed, well, yeah, Rasputin has these powers that other doctors do not possess. So he was sort of protective of it. And it's believed that Rasputin was actually had enough influence that he could have potentially prevented entrance of Russia into World War I, which obviously that's a threat to the conservative nobility, to that deep state. So uh, that is why it's believed he was killed by them, because he was essentially becoming an embarrassment, but also a, uh, a power risk versus uh, their own objectives. But just that kind of perspective of Nicholas as, oh, you've got this guy very close to your wife. There's kind of the whispers, oh, he's a cuckold. Whether that was true or not, even the implication, even people associating that with you is not good as a man. Uh, it hurts your image. I don't care how progressive you think you are. It is not a good thing to, to have on your record. Oh, this is getting a little bit ahead of it, but then they enter into World War I, and he goes to the front line, Nicholas, because he wants to lead the battle. That seems heroic, but it also took him out of the power center. And so by the time the revolution took hold, right, they didn't even know what was going on. And he was so unpopular that the white Russians didn't even bother trying to rescue him. They could have done so relatively, uh, relatively easily, and they just didn't do so. There wasn't like, a, oh, okay, let's all rally around the monarch. So he was just left there. And unfortunately, that horrendous event occurred. But it really shows you the importance as a leader. You can't be sort of just, oh, yeah, everything's fine, well intentioned. You have to question the people around you. And I think that he was a little bit too trusting. They said he would be respectful of men. Uh, he was used to his grandfather being this very tall, dominant man. So if he found guys like that, he would put them around him if they were necess not necessarily on his side in terms of reforming. They could be actively undermining his interests. And so you always have to be proactive in that sense. I don't think he really was. And if he was, it came too late or the voice wasn't loud enough. 
But then what Radvinsky says, and you hear some other sources, is that even with communism, it was basically a replacement of the Tsarist system with a new Tsar, and of course uh, Lenin and Stalin, and now you have Putin. So over a hundred years later, we still are not seeing Russia really say, we want to be democratic. Um, maybe you say, well, democracy isn't good for Russia. Maybe it just hasn't been built up from the, uh, you know, from the grassroots enough. But nevertheless, it's an interesting topic. So I hope you found this kind of enlightening. And if there's other historical subjects you want to see me bring up, just drop them below.